Welcome back to The Accidental Writer at the Alex Cafe. I'm Susan Berg. And I'm Dick Ross, co-host extraordinaire. Our first person is Christy, Christy Collins, and she, her debut novel is a really absorbing read about, of all things, local government. And I'm a refugee from local government, so I loved it. <laughs> We've also got the beautiful Heidi Victoria, who was the former Minister for the Arts, and has done an amazing book, which is all about how the people within the arts have coped with COVID. And finally, we've got a guy called Marty Monster. Now, I suspect that man has been uh, through the titles office and changed his name by deed poll. Marty Monster, he also wears an extraordinary jacket of which I'm incredibly jealous. And he's our poet for today with Hamish. Enjoy the show. Christy, thanks for joining us today. You've written an amazing book, The Price of Two Sparrows. Give us a bit of a detail about what the book's about. Oh, thank you. Um, it's a book about an ornithologist, Heiko, who uh, tries to stop a building development um, on environmental grounds. And it later turns out that that development is for a mosque. And so it explores that, um, that dynamic in a community on the outskirts of Sydney. Um, uh, from a sort of 360 degrees, so with lots of different characters involved and their different perspectives. One thing that does matter is that it takes place around the time of the Coronella riots between um, some people in the Islamic community and people not in that community. Would you still write that book in the same way today? No, I think things have changed. So um, initially I set the book in the Netherlands and I set it between two assassinations, both that were related to uh, these types of issues. And Cronella fell in the middle of that, that period. Uh, and then when I moved it to Australia, I left Cronella in. And it, it, um, yeah, I think it really does speak to what was going on all across the world mm. at that time. Um, but I do think things have shifted somewhat um, in the intervening time, yeah. So how long did it take you to write the book? It took about eight years. Okay. Yeah, including a PhD period where I was able to work on it more or less full time. I thought it was sort of my life because you don't know this, but for 20 years or almost 20 years, I was a mayor and councillor in local government. And, you know, this is a planning dispute. Um, and that used to be my bread and butter. So, and I hated it. Oh, but you could relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I hated planning because mm. it's about winners and losers. Yeah, it's, I think it's remarkable. I never expected to meet a mayor and talk about it. <laughs> um, and, and I, yeah, I do think that I've maybe been a little cruel to the mayor in the book. No, it's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be crueler. So I right. wrote about local government in a sort of similar context and I was as cruel as I could possibly be. The uh, pomposity, the pretension, the repetition of the same speech over and over so that, you know, crappy old councillors and mayors get to listen to their voice drone on. So I As was... As you can hear. <laughs> I, I thought you were quite, quite nice. Oh, that's generous. <laughs> well, my supervisor said to me at one point, oh, there's a lot of um, mundane material, isn't there? Yeah, I think you need to strip it out. And so there, there was sort of like a lot of council meetings and a lot of emails and, and she's like, oh, I don't think people want to read that in their leisure so, time. So, so did you go through and do that yourself or did the editor go through and say we don't need this scene? Oh, so at that time she suggested I cut the book in half, so it was about full length and I cut half of it out and then we started again. So that's that's long before the book was So when quiet. people tell you to rewrite, yes. basically rewrite from scratch, not rewrite from scratch but, you know, do r radical surgery, yeah. how did you pick yourself up? dust yourself off and keep going. Yeah, that's quite demanding, that, uh, that sort of cut out, cut out half of what you've written. Um, I just resolved to do it, that was the first thing, just like, okay, this is what the book needs now and it just needs to be done. So I took a weekend, I had a session at university where I could go and work with other people for a whole weekend and I just sat there and just crossed things out and eventually went back and, and put it into the document, and that is, took things out of the document. And yeah, I had to rewrite it again more recently to move it from the Netherlands to Australia. So it sort of happened to me twice. Mm. It's just a matter of doing what needs to be done at the time and <laughs> having a bit of faith that it's moving in the right direction. The thing about the Islamic issue, it is a live issue. Um, 
when I was on council, we did some work with the local Muslim community. And after the atrocity in New Zealand, huh. we had a, on the lawns of the town hall, we had a prayer session with all of the religions there, but it was an Islamic Muslim prayer session. Mm -hmm. And we were abused. Someone said, uh, came up and said, you know, they're all rapists, get rid of them. Oh gosh, um, yeah. Like, and I was humiliated, yeah. absolutely humiliated that my community would be so bigoted or contain mm. such bigots. Interestingly, they were so used to it. They were not fussed. Really? Well, that's or to alarming. me, they weren't. Right, yeah, yeah. Incredibly. That's sad, really, isn't it's it? It's terrible. Oh, no, yeah. it was terrible. It was absolutely yeah. terrible. And I, so like, I was really interested in mm. this. Um, I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying that the Muslim community are heroic. Is that correct? I mean, I think that they contain flawed individuals as well, but, um, well, they, they persist in, in chasing their dream, I think, for it. Um, but they also are trying to fit in with the other norms and, and ideals, for example, that they want the building to be extremely environmentally friendly. Yes, and, they are and very take aware. into account in the um, Indigenous owners, the first right, Australians. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you said it took eight years to write. Yeah. How did you get to the point where you knew it was ready to approach a publisher and how did that come about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think you just work and work and work and then at a certain point you think this is this is all I can do um, and I had been sending it around to a few different places and um, I had a friend who had done an internship at a firm and she said oh, I think I think uh, I know someone who might be interested in it and so I sent it to her and um, yeah and they were really interested so, which was great. And they got back within how long? Um, so uh, there was sort of a little bit of silence and then um, I wrote another draft actually and I sent, I wrote an email to, wow. the, to the editor and said, would you like the new draft? And she said, oh yes, I haven't even started, send me the new draft. And she got back to me within days of that. Fantastic. That must yeah. have been exciting then. It was After very exciting. so much work being put into it, you could finally abandon it, which is the word I like, because you never <laughs> ever finish that's a book. Um, that's what I found. I mean, yeah. my book was never finished, but I got to the point where I was like, I'm just done, yeah. I've just had enough. Yeah. Um, so we abandon our work. Uh, <laughs> so that must have been really exciting then to, to get the call, the email, how did it come through that yes, we're going to take this on? Uh, so she uh, met with me in a cafe in, in Melbourne. It was near my work, because I had to work that day. Uh, and she, we just had a chat and she said, I think we'd really like to, to publish it. She was talking about moving it to Australia and we're sort of talking about, about that. But that cafe now, I still pass it when I come to and from work every day and it's lovely. It's like, oh, that's where I found out that yeah. my book was going to be published. So Fantastic. Really nice. And so how much more editing was done then once it, it got in with the publisher? Well, a lot because it got rewritten. Right, into as, it. Yeah, yeah. so I think it was quite mm. clean in its sort of original So it was version. your uh, your current publisher who told you to relocate it yeah, from Yeah, that's Holland. right. Yeah. yeah, so it had been finished as a whole PhD project and completely edited for that as a thesis, like a bound thesis. And then, yeah, done again, so rewritten for Australia and obviously the process after that. Mm. So this yeah. came out in January uh, 2021. So congratulations on having the book published and it's a wonderful read. And, and what about the future? Have you got more books coming? Oh, uh, yes, I'm working on a book about virtual reality and travel, which, uh, yeah, it's really nice to be working on something completely different in a completely different universe. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting to be on a new project. Have you given yourself a time frame for that? I'm presuming you're thinking maybe eight years you might <laughs> Compress cut it, a it little. down? Or? Maybe. Well, it's, I started it in 2017. Um, so, yeah, it's starting to think it might be good to sort of pull it towards a... <laughs> <laughs> maybe within a year. So have it ready you've to send out. almost done four years already. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But I think now that you've got a publisher on board, they'll encourage you, won't they, to, to yeah, keep moving? Yeah, they're keen to and, see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's that, nice. Knowing that you've already got a publisher, I think, gives you that motivation to move forward more quickly because you've been through the process and you know it can be done, it will be done, and um, I think it's more motivating then to to get the work finished. Yeah, and I think as well, you know that there are some things that can be left into the editing process that you don't, in your first novel, you can't do that. You need it to be really clean to send it off, but mm. in this case, they might be willing to see it a little earlier than than with the previous one, so yeah. that's lucky as well. Yeah. Well, we look forward to having you back with the next book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Good on you, Christy. Thanks, Thanks very much. much.
Heidi, thanks for joining oh. us. Um, <laughs> We're doing it. We're going for it. Um, fabulous book, The Show Must Go On. Mm. So this is a book which goes through the performing arts and what people were doing over COVID. Absolutely. Um, tell us how you came about. Well, out of adversity came your opportunity. You're dead right, Dick, and I've got to say it was a, a very adverse year for a lot of people. Mm. But before we even got to COVID, which of course is pretty wet, you know, a year ago now, um, back on the 6th of March last year, I had a stroke. And as a result of that stroke, they take away your licence and, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I can't work as a photographer if I can't drive around and get my gear around. And then, of course, a week later... Can I just rudely interrupt and yeah. say... You don't look like the classic stroke victim. No. Either I'm the classic either, stroke survivor. <laughs> and you could have knocked me over with a feather when you said just then that you've had a stroke. Yeah. And because um, you've totally recovered, hospital. I've done really well, and I, you know, I'm so grateful for all the medical specialists who've been. They involved. are amazing, and I understand that stroke medication and treatment has been revolutionised over yeah. the past decade. Leaps and bounds. And, you know, I believe that everybody, you know, has a, a, a silver lining story, no matter how big or small, out of COVID. And so my silver lining is that when I was incapacitated and, and had to think about what I would do, especially as a theatre photographer and, you know, theatre closing down, what mm. was I going to do? And so I conjured up this idea of a very small exhibition of 20 images, um, <laughs> which well, sort of grew. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and so I thought I'd do something in so town. So you don't have an off button? So I don't have an off button, but I did have an off button when the Premier limited us to 5Ks. Mm. So that kind of was the end of the project, you know, by necessity. But I did manage to sneak over into New South... Well, I won't say sneak because the borders weren't closed. But I did go to New South Wales and the ACT, went out to Bathurst, and so some of the, the stuff was shot interstate. We're all New South Wales? Rural New South Wales, mm. and so I managed to do that before, again, the borders closed on us. But one thing that they did find after I'd had the stroke was that at 53, they sort of started questioning why I was a woman of my age having a stroke, and they found that I had a hole in my heart. Fuck so, me. So really, so you had So this, it was a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> so you had this chronic underlying serious condition. Yeah, that I didn't know about. And so that's, well, that's my the silver, silver lining, lining was that the stroke led to the heart. Absolutely. So had I not done all of that, it wouldn't have you know led me to the place where I've now had the heart repaired, and they did that between the two lockdowns in June, right. sort of June July right. last year. You're feeling better? I'm feeling a hundred percent. You know, do you think I'm it dangerous. was a drag? On, <laughs> do you think it was Fabulous. a drag on your? So the other thing about you is that you're a former minister for the arts. Yeah. You're an arts junkie. Yes. Yeah. And, I've been uh, described as that before. I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> arts tragic. Yeah. And so this book is sort of like a, com a combination of your reaction to COVID, your sort of... My circumstances. Your circum individual circumstances yeah. and your adoration and seniority in the arts. Yeah, I think it's it's all of that rolled in and very much because it was supposed to be this small exhibition of, of 20 images and sort of a grew like topsy but when I realized how big it was getting and just how important everybody's stories were because I do like a chat and I probably spoke to everybody for two or three hours before I took their photograph because I wanted to know about them mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. they were doing as the, the title of the book or the subtitle is what the performing arts were doing when they weren't doing what we know they do yes. and so when I got to speak with people who I knew relatively well, but I didn't know that Marina Pryor, for example, has this absolute thing about candles and was making the most beautifully scented homemade candles. Or that Rhonda... That sort of doesn't... Why doesn't that surprise me about Marina? No, it doesn't. <laughs> and her home is just always filled with candles. She's beautiful. And Rhonda Birchmore, for example, has had this thing for coloured glass her entire life. And she's been hoarding all this coloured glass and wanted to do mosaics. But, of course, as yay, a, a woman who doesn't stop working, when she had to stop working because of COVID, she got out the coloured glass and did these mm. amazing mosaics, which of course is the photo in the book. So for me, it was very much finding out about what everybody was doing before I photographed them. I didn't just go point and shoot. Yeah. I'm an environmental portraitist, so I really want to 
honour the environment in which I find my subject matter. By um, environment, in that context, you don't. You mean it could be an urban environment correct. as well as a, it's their environment, a, a natural environment, or a rural environment. Exactly, and there are a couple of those in there as well. Um, I mean, comes to mind the one of, of Callum Francis and um, and Ainsley Mellum. You know, on the farm. On the farm, which is. I think I'm allowed to have a favourite. Oh, please, don't anybody <laughs> ring me. But it is, it's the perfect... Ringer. <laughs> You've all Harasser. got my number. <laughs> um, but it is well, the it's most, a, it's, it's a perfect a, photo. You know, it's as far it's as got I'm, a Gigi in it. It's got two Gigi's in it. Yeah. And, and it was just the right place at the right time. But of course, knowing the story of how the boys ended up on the farm in Bathurst, um, you know, Callum had come out of his um, last performance as, as Lola on Broadway, Ainsley had done Aladdin on Broadway, then came back to Australia. They were both starring in things here in Australia. Disney gave the call up to Ainsley to say, please come back, we love you as Aladdin, come back. And so they packed up the, the house, uh, put everything into storage, were about to head to Broadway, and two days before they were due to leave, of course, Broadway shut down. Mm. And so they had nowhere to go. So they went out to Bathurst, and so we've called the, the picture from Broadway to Bathurst. <laughs> and so the boys are in sparkly Broadway sort of opening night gear, but with two beautiful horses out on the land. Yeah, so, so I mean, it certainly grew from 20. Uh, how, how many different interviews have we got in there's this There's 72 people featured and 64 images, because some are, are couples. Right, and that's a lot so. of work for you that you've spent putting into this and interviewing and None of many, it was many hours. It wasn't work. <laughs> oh, no, Work's was the form in a word. A lot of enjoyment. A lot, a of, lot of enjoyment. Absolutely. And I'm just so, I was so privileged to have been allowed into people's lives and into their homes. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that I'm so very proud of with this project is I am, um, this was alluding to the, the shameless plug on the book, is a portion of the sales whilst the um, whilst the exhibition is on, is going towards entertainment assist. Wonderful. And so EA do phenomenal work. And in fact, the, the research they've done into the mental health of the performing arts industry, from roadies, you know, dunny cleaners to promoters and performers, it's groundbreaking. It's actually world leading. And so what mm. they've been doing is, you know, obviously chugging along with what they do, gaining more money, more research and then as a result of that they've also been followed mm. and for me the probably the most important thing about producing this rather than just the exhibition was to be able to present it to politicians to arts ministers to treasurers mm. to premiers and say please read the stories because so some of them are only, don't they, in the entertainment industry? For our industry was left behind. Yeah, you know, there's no doubt about it, and there's obviously lots of reasons for that. So obviously, we're on short-term contracts, um, and just for those who are sitting at home going, "She was a politician for 12 years. She's fine. She's on a pension." No, because that was actually abolished before I went in. So after don't I you, left Parliament, don't you get that's it, it if you do more than 12 years? No, no, it actually was abolished in 2004. I went in in 2006. So like everybody that's watching today, I have to go out and earn a living. Mm. And so my living was truncated, you know, or... Because of the electoral process, as well, indeed no, no. was mine. <laughs> no, I meant more, more about COVID, you know, so my, yeah. I see my living as, as a photographer, you know, I've yeah. gone back to that, um, which of course is what I trained in more than 35 years ago at, at uni. So I have a, a Bachelor of Arts in Fine Art Photography. Can you imagine an arts minister who is actually qualified as an artist? Well, <laughs> that's right. My wife, as an economist, says the same about treasurers. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't give me treasury. All the money would go to the arts. <laughs> Having said that... You're naughty. You know, well, uh, yeah, but speak the truth. Um, <laughs> I have nothing to lose. But, you know, this book was very much about how do I tell the story of the industry and mm. what we went through. Well, thank you so much for coming in and, and sharing your work with it. It's, My it's pleasure. It's been wonderful to have you here. The, thank you so much for having me. The photos are sublime. Thank mm. you. I love the new colourful 
costume you're wearing. How did you come by that? Oh, um, 10 o'clock this morning, uh, it's 3 o'clock now, um, turned up in the mail. Wonderful. Uh, it's Great an eBay special. Great it's, timing for the interview. Yeah, absolutely. So, Marty, you do poetry and spoken word. Yes. And you also write plays as well. Yes, I do, yeah. How did you gravitate into the, the poetry and spoken word scene in Melbourne? Um, I've been connected to the art scene since the 90s, running an art gallery or co-running an art gallery and um, being involved in arts magazines and things like that. And um, with music and song and reading a lot of literature and that sort of thing, I thought, why not try mm -hmm. poetry and spoken word? Where um, did you first start performing publicly? It would have been five years ago now, Hamish. Yep, yep, yeah, yep, which is about the time I arrived in Melbourne. Very I remember much so, yeah. seeing you at places like the Dan O'Connell. Oh, yes, and, and yeah, Bar Uzu and Bar Open Uzu, Studio. Yeah, yeah, and that. And yeah, so yeah, but you've become part of the scene. Mm. And last year during the pandemic, you kept busy writing and you actually launched a collection called Fruit, published a collection called Fruit Salad. Very much so, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what type of poetry did you put into that? Um, basically, um, the reason why I call it Fruit Salad because it's a medley of different types of um, writing. I've got parables, fables, prose, and um, poetry and I thought I could call it a medley but I thought fruit salad would be a, a great idea to um, name the book and because um, it is a medley of different ty styles of writing. Right. Um, that and, that um, reminds me of a poetry event I curated many years ago in Sydney. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever done it and I called it sweet and s sour fried short soup <laughs> yeah, I like because that. of the mixture of yeah. poetry and people that were involved in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, so with the pandemic, of course, you haven't had much chance to perform like most of us haven't over the no. last year. So you going to be launching this book soon? Yep, I've got a launch of the book on the 30th of March. Right. Um, Passionist Tongues Poetry and the Brothers Public House right. in Johnson Street, Fitzroy. Great, that, um, that's fantastic. So yeah, no, that, it's... Um, I mean, I got a copy of it myself when I read uh, the poetry as well. Mm. Um, what was the main theme, apart from the mixture of styles that you had in well, your book? With the parables and fables, what I wanted to capture is the key messages through fables. Um, and I drew on my childhood um, of living on a farm. Right. And, um, and I like the key messages that come out of parables and fables, whether it's from animals or... Um, through the key lessons that we can learn from parables and fables. Um, the general prose it, um, is called Lucy. Lucy yes. is my inner self um, who talks to me and gives me guidance and it's a, a journey of Lucy and addiction to heroin and she makes nonsensical advice to me when it's not necessarily very, um, necessary and um, it's a relationship I have with her. And then I've, um, the closure of the book is just general um, poetry and... Right. Yeah. Would you describe Lucy as a guardian angel or...? A I, yes, I do, but she, um, she doesn't necessarily give, give good advice. Um, right. Uh, she might tell me that um, people who have bad breath have bad breath and I mm -hmm. might be in a sticky situation and I, I say, gee, thanks, Lucy, that, but... I really need your help right now. And, so um, inappropriate timing. Yeah, her, very yeah, much yeah, so. Okay, yeah, and, yeah. But it, I, I have her as my inner, inner voice that um, could pot potentially guide me, but she doesn't necessarily make the market in the stories that I've okay, written. Okay, still a bit of homework to be done on her part. <laughs> very much yeah. so. I know the other thing that you've been doing more recently is you've been getting into playwriting. Very much yeah, so. Yeah. And that you've been, um, you've had a couple of scripts performed at readings at one at La Mama, yes. and also more recently at the Cracked Actors Theatre, which is just down here at yeah, Albert Park um, Lake. Yeah, How? I've had um, three pl three plays that I've had read. Mm -hmm. and I'm in currently in the middle of a, a new play. Mm -hmm. um, what got me into playwriting effectively was um, I, I saw myself as a storyteller. Right. And you can see that in a new book and um, a chapbook that I produced a few years ago. That I I've, I writing stories is something that I found interesting and um, it's just led me to writing plays. Um, and I had the success of um, 
uh, having a play, uh, radio play at La Mama Theatre back in 2019. Great. Yep. And um, I've had two plays read at Cracked Actors, which are just down in Elba Park. Yep. And um, because of the pandemic, I'll probably look for next year um, to do a full production on one of my plays. Right, yeah. Yeah, like everything, it's, it's taking time for venues to get back on their feet and oh, very go public so. again. But that's yep. the way it's been for everybody. I, I think the common thing that I've found about your work in both the poetry and the plays is, as you say, the storytelling. Mm. You've got a strong narrative drive in the scenes that you set and in, in the characters and guardian angels that you bring to play in your books. Some, something that interests me a lot is looking at the psychology of characters mm -hmm. because you, you start with a blank sheet and, say, and you've got, okay, I'm creating a character. What's their personality type? Mm -hmm. um, what's their behaviour patterns and things like that. And I really enjoy creating a character and, um, and the combination of characters in a play and the narrative that goes with it. So. Do you ever draw the characters from people you know or do you I do. blur the um, line so that they can't be easily identified? Uh, loosely. Yeah. Yes, loosely, <laughs> I do. Yeah, yeah, um, I think we, can, we all, when we write poetry or we write anything, uh, we mm -hmm. always draw on our experiences. Yep. And, and um, if a character might have a, um, similarities to someone you've met or, you know, someone in your family, a yes. parent or anything like that. And uh, that's, you do always draw on that. Um, yeah, no, yeah. well, it can't help be, but be influenced by the people you meet and encounter. Oh, very much so. No, that's great. Well, that, that's fantastic, Marty. And as you said, your launch is on March the 30th at the Brothers at Public House for Passionate Tongues Poetry, which now is, I believe, in its 22nd year of very much public so. poetry events with Michael yeah. Reynolds. Um, so, yeah, that, that's something very much to look forward to. This one thing, I'll be dressed up as Carmen Miranda. Carmen Miranda, of course, rather <laughs> like the front cover of your book, Fruit yeah, Salad. Yeah, I'll be dressed Wonderful. up as, so, so I'm encouraging everyone to get dressed up on the evening. Uh, something of a carnival atmosphere. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Great. Yeah. Yeah, Fantastic. Well, so. Looking forward to it very much. Thank and you. thank you so much for coming along to the Alex Cafe today. Thank you very much, Hamish. This story is called My Coin Collection. I started a coin collection. It lasted a week. I lie. I kept up the facade for three days. It came to me, I don't use notes and coins to make my way. I use my bank card to buy the ingredients of life. I need to find some coins to fulfill my obsession. I looked under the seat of the car. I looked in between the cushions of the sofa. In my wardrobe, Coins fall from trousers and get stuck in jackets, so I looked there. All I could find was $6.25. This was made up of 5, 10 and 20 cent coins, plus one 50 cent coin. I'm off to the coin laundry to bring them back to life. I had this belief that dirty coins could be cleansed and be rid of their past. With a wide smile, a spring in my step, I walk calmly into the coin laundry. Oh, hang on, what's going on here? I said. People were not cleaning their coins. They were watching their socks and jocks tumbling in washing machines and dryers, folding clothes, reading magazines, and chatting to anyone who'd listen. I let out a scream, followed by a shriek, followed by the shock of misrepresentation. Coin laundries don't sue what they say, I screamed. A woman approximately 63, in green top, knitted skirt, sandals, approached me with sympathetic eyes. My dear man, I'm so sorry. Did they not tell you? Who, I said. Your parents, didn't they not tell you? What? What, what, I said. Did they not tell you about Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy and Unicorns? Yes, I did. I strongly believe in Santa and unicorns, but I have my doubts about the tooth fairy though. I'm an only child and I did shift work and I rarely saw them. Sit down, son, and I'll tell you about some truths of life. Parents tell their children lies to protect them from the harsh world we live in. Santa Claus, unicorns and coin laundries do not exist. Your parents failed you, young man. My life can't go on, I said. 
What is real anymore? How old are you, young man? I'm 32 and a half on Sunday, I squeaked. It's time to grow up. Life is not cupcakes and teddy bears. Oh, my smalls are dry. Good luck, young man. I walked slowly across Potter's Field to the bridge over the Rancid River. I crawled over the railing onto a plank that looked like a diving board. What else is a lie? I said, weeping. Don't tell me that politicians aren't honest, I screamed. They're not, mate, a gruff voice bellowed. I turned to the gruff voice, slipped from the plank, never to be seen again. Well, another show's in the can. I, um, I actually enjoyed it, not tooting my own trumpet, but um, Christie's book, hmm. I, I loved it because it was an exceptional work of art and, and interesting writing, but also because selfishly it reflected a bit on what I've spent the last 20 years doing, which is... Yeah, you could is, relate to it. Mm. I could relate to it. Mm. Um, interestingly, the main protagonist was a bit of a dickhead, <laughs> which I don't get, you know. <laughs> he was a bit of a dickhead and, um, and a lot of things went wrong for him. But, and, do, and do you think that's how she meant it to be? Uh, I do, I do. And um, he... He had some redeeming features, but not many. I suppose people might say that about me. What did you think of Heidi? Oh, look, I loved having Heidi on today, and it was really wonderful that she shared her own personal journey. So having gone through having had a stroke and then that leading to discovering that she had a hole in her heart, she's been through her own traumas over, you know, the last year. So. Wonderful that she was very generous to open up and share that with, with us today. She didn't hold back and, like, mm. I can imagine myself being in the same position where I'd be a little bit more secretive, but mm. she she was a sharer and, you know, that's part of the thing about death and disability is that it does give you some insight mm. into the preciousness, mm. the rarity of life mm. and the need to get into it and why COVID was such, mm. well, that's what it meant to me. You know, mm. I thought, I looked at all of these young people who are sort of in younger roles and they're losing opportunity because of lockdown, so. Mm. Well, it's good to see other people that are sharing their journeys and we hope that that gives you permission to open up and share your own personal journeys with others and help you to heal if you're going through your own difficulties. So thanks for joining us this week and we look forward to seeing you again. See you later.